That's right, the new unit, telecommunications. So this is just the intro, the beginning, a little bit of background history and stuff. Some of it's going to be so obvious and so, um, well, you, you're, you're familiar with it because you're just, life has taught you a few things about how we use telecommunications these days. But everything has a beginning, and we've been learning that throughout this course, that one thing builds on another and you need to have certain things in, in place, perhaps even for another completely different reason before you start to develop new technologies. And the technologies are usually going to come about, in, particularly in the West, um, as a result of some need for military advantage or financial advantage, in the main. Now, that's, that's an, not something you need to um, go to the bank on, but it, I'd say that if you look back over history, you're gonna find that 80% of the things that get, happen generally happen for one of those two reasons. A third reason might be that every so often, someone comes along who just does it because it's the right thing to do. Um, medicine often gets advances through people who have just done the right thing. It was obvious, some, or a tragedy has happened and they, they find a solution to the tragedy. Or look into why does something happen in a certain way uh, in the physicality of humans. But anyway, in the main, what pushes along our engineering has been either some form of advantage to a, a group of people in a militaristic way or protective military way. Defence is just as important and or it was a financial reason, trade, other things like that. Okay, so telecommunications, telecommunication. Communication is probably a word you're used to. Uh, we talk to each other, that's communication. Tele is an old, I think it's Greek. I actually have to check that one, but it means uh, across large distances. So when you hear the word telescope, telescope or, or that telegraph or you know this is letters across a distance so telecommunications is communicating at a distance basically and we can do that very well today in fact this is you are living in a an age that is unprecedented in human history in the ability for us to communicate with each other at any time of the day in any way we like and i mean any way we like i mean you can literally video phone people these days, a la Dick Tracy from the cartoons in the 50s. You know, there are, you have available to you technology that just was literally science fiction 25, 30 years ago. Um, just finished watching a, a series that's been on the, uh, on the telly, on, on the um, Ostar, about um, back in time for the weekend, which was about what people did on their weekends and how they spent their leisure time. And it was a surprise to this family that it was only during the 90s that the mobile phone became a, a, a reasonably cheap enough thing for everybody to have. Um, and when they first got a phone that was not like uh, a normal phone, connected to the wall by a wire, that was still connected, you walk around the house, was a wireless phone. And they thought it was remarkable, that, but that it was only 25 years ago. And yet now there are... <laughs> There are just as many phones in Australia as there are people, perhaps more, because there's obviously ones that have been thrown away on just sitting in the drawer somewhere that haven't been used for ages. So telecommunications has become a major part of our lives. Um, I, I remember joking with my daughters once, I was sitting watching them, um, I've got three daughters and two of them were at home, they're sitting on the balcony and they were communicating with the third one um, and they were texting each other, but they were actually texting each other sitting next to each other. I mean, they could talk to each other, but they texted each other so that they were including everybody in. And I finally just said, look, why don't you just call each other and put on speakerphone? Um, which they did, and they sat there and had the conversation. But it was just like, come on, guys, you know. And there's also these things you see on telly and all these, these recent ads about, you know, look up. Look up. It was a, it was a campaign in, in, in Britain, and it wasn't about looking up just to, you know, <laughs> Oh, what's going on? You know, it was the idea that too many people were getting into accidents, walking across roads by looking down at their phones. And so they brought out a, a, a campaign to get people to stop looking at their phones when they were walking around and having a conversation with real people. Yeah. Anyway, so that's where we're at now. So how do we get there? How did it all begin? Well, you can go back and you can start to investigate the obvious. When you need to communicate over long distances, you've got to look at the options available. If you go far enough back, there weren't too many. Um, you go back into ancient history and you can see that uh, similar things to what you might see on Game, Game of Thrones, you know, ravens. So you could use birds, and they did. 
they train birds to fly, homing pigeons in particular. So if you had a, a bird that was used to living in a particular area and you took it away from that area, it would fly back to that area. Um, unfortunately, you often lose your messages on the way because you know sparrowhawks and other things could get in the road and, and, and kill the bird. Or you could get people to do it for you and you could have runners. And they did. The, the um, marathon race is a celebration of a message being delivered from the field of marathon to Athens to tell them that the Persians had been defeated and that the preparations for completing the, the, the fleet that was necessary could be done. So the runner, history says that the runner ran all the way and dropped dead, but I don't think that was the case um, because it wasn't that far, you know, but it was far enough. But the, the race distance is set by the distance from Marathon to Athens. Um, he's a runner, he's a messenger. Um, and there's an old phrase, you know, too, that, you know, don't shoot the messenger because that was the idea that you're only carrying the message. So bad news, the kings used to kill the people who bring the bad news. Well, that's not a good thing because people who had bad news wouldn't show up. So you know, if, I got, if I had some bad news for the king and I knew that when I got there and gave him the bad news and he's going to lose his temper, I'm just going to run somewhere else. So basically runners, you know, that was one way. Um, apparently in the Andes, um, because the um, Chilean, uh, the kingdoms running through the, Chil the Chilean kingdom, the Aztecs and uh, the Mayans and things, a lot of these valleys were really deep and hard to navigate. And they set up a system of communication down there along the, the Andes mountain range where they'd have a series of runners stationed at 10 k's or 15 k's, whatever was a reasonable distance. And a message could be handed off to the next guy and then he'd walk back to his original place and they'd just get these messages. And I was told that it wasn't till the 1960s, or in that period, in the late 60s, when aircraft could get into these regions, that they could deliver messages faster. That was the quickest way of getting messages around in the Andes, was to use these runner translator things, the systems. A whole empire was held together by these, this communication device, just by people running every so often, short distances. In America, you've heard of the Pony Express. Similar idea. A setup of having a, a bunch of horses stationed along a particular path to get messages from the east to the west coast. And the Pony Express would ride really fast from one side to the other. Um, mail became, as we saw in a aviation, uh, delivering messages over long distances became a really important impetus for the development of passenger aircraft. They used the bombers after World War I to deliver the mail and they took along people just for the extra. Um, and then finally they said, well, the, actually people are prepared to pay, so we'll get rid of the mail, send them by separate planes and we'll take people individually. So all of this stuff has a start somewhere. Right? Um, in uh, Lord of the Rings, I use Game of Thrones for the ravens. In Lord of the Rings, what did they have on the tops of mountains to let let him let them tell Gondor, it, you know, Mordor was coming. You know, you know. The, the, the fires. fires, you know, fires. Now these sorts of things. That's actually a development that would later be developed by the Greeks, or was developed by the Greeks, where they use the sun shining off shields or, light, or using it on a mirror surface, and they'd flick it backwards and forwards, and that would then create an, an, a message that could be read uh, called a heliograph. Helio for the sun. Helio was um, the Greek, I think, again, for the sun, sun god, uh, Helios. Um, so a heliograph was sending it by light. It would later then be turned into light m uh, messages. So you have a, a lantern um, that you'd flash on and off with a, just by opening and closing a, a cabinet thing with a light in front of it. Um, the message had to be understood. So you have to have a code involved. Now, there's a couple of things wrong with this type of message system. One is that you have to rely on the other person being there to see it. So visual line of sight is important. So if it's raining, or cloudy, or foggy, uh, the message ain't going to get through. Even if you have fires on the tops of the mountains, it relies on you seeing the fires. Um, in that particular situation, the fires being lit was a one-off situation. It was a chain. Everybody just lit the fires and let the message go once. But if you're going to send it backwards and forwards, you need a code. Uh, if you follow sport and follow baseball, or little, pretty much any sport really, the communications that are used in baseball are intriguing because they have the signals, sending in the signals. And it's all this sort of touching the hands and, the, and, and doing this sort of thing. You'll see them doing all this sort of stuff and you go, what the? And, you know, and, and then also the catcher is sitting there and he goes down, points at the ground and points and he says, I want a fastball up inside, you know, this sort of thing. That's reliant on the guy at the other side knowing what you're doing with your fingers. I mean, he could, I watch the game and I have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> right? 
But they say that they have to hide the signals too because apparently on some of those situations, and this is one of the other problems when you have a visual signal, is that it can be overseen by your enemy. I mean, it's open to anybody to see. You know, you're not restricting it to just your messages. So unless it's in a specific code that only the other guy knows. But if the other guy catches on to what's going on, can read it or understand it, which, is hap which happens apparently, um, in baseball, the, the guy who goes to second base can see the signs from the, um, the, the catcher. And so he'll then relay the signs off to someone else who's in the, you know, the, the batting box ready to go on, who can then let the batter know, or he can give it to the batter himself you know, by standing there. And the batter looks back past the picture and you can see that the guy's probably put his hand up like this to his head, which means it's probably going to be a high fastball or to right or something like that. So they're all trying to outdo each other. Right? Uh, all these signals. But that relies on understanding the signals. So developing codes for that. Because you can't speak over that distance. Right? It's not language that's being used. It's, it's the rudimentary kind of coding that we would later term with NOAS that developed by Samuel Morse. The Morse code system, which, which became a popular and accepted one. We'll get to that in a minute and what the dates for those things were. Another method that was used was to actually use physical um, signs, if you like, You're holding up signs. Or, but signs can't be read over big distances, so you might hold up a flag. And positioning the flag above your head might mean something, or positioning it down meant something else, or to the right, or you know, having two flags, you can increase the message content. And that's the term for that is semaphore. And semaphore, again, is from the idea of sign bearing. That's basically what it means, semaphore, sign bearers. Now, all of this stuff is cool, but it's limited. And as I said, it's limited by things like weather, visual, incompetence from the operators. I mean, it relies on the, the operator actually doing a good job of sending the message. Um, you know, the, uh, if you can't read it, then if you don't understand, if it's someone at the other end to understand all it could be is, oh look, smoke signals, what's that mean? Well, the Indians are coming. You know, what are they saying? I have no idea, it's just smoke. What, what if it's just a grass fire? I don't know, it could be Indians. Know. <laughs> Who knows? So you've got to have some competency at both ends, and that's a possibility. And it also could be in, um, interpreted by your enemy if you weren't careful. The codification of these things were very important in situations where no other means of communication was immediately available. Like you couldn't have a runner walk between ships in a naval battle. Right? So you, it doesn't work. Or swimmers, swimmers, you know, I mean, it's not going to happen. Um, so one of the first places semaphore becomes codified is in naval warfare. And one of the big deals where this became really important was during the Napoleonic Wars um, towards the end of the 1700s. The French versus the, the British and the Spaniards and all that other mix that went into it. And um, that was largely conducted as a war with, with flags. So you, you were trying to get your particular group of, of ships into a position that gave you an advantage. And that was all done by communication ship to ship through flag semaphoring. So that became really important that they codified it. Um, then as naval uh, warfare turned into um, na uh, naval uh, maritime commerce, then maritime commerce took that on as well. And a lot of ships you might see from the 1800s would have a line of flags up and across the top and down the front. And often those flags would indicate cargo, uh, who's the owner of the under what flag you are flying, um, more than just the nation, but what was the information about the ship involved. Um, they also used flags when coming into port to indicate whether there is disease on the ship or whether there was disease on the port, so you could stay separate. Um, one of the classic ones was the yellow flag, which was put out for what became yellow fever. Um, so this was a way of communicating from ship to shore. Um, and such. So these are signs, semaphoring. Okay, that's really still restricted by the idea that you can see them, all of that stuff. What sort of things start to take place towards the end of the 1700s that we've already looked at that you're aware of? The end of the 1700s. Okay, telegraph is coming, but what do you need first? 
you need to have an appreciation and understanding of electricity, yes. So the late 1700s, the experimentations being done, particularly in England and other places like Germany and places like that, where they were starting to understand a little bit more about this phenomenon of electricity. And the guy who was probably the most important in this, do you remember, from that period, early 1800s, 1820s, 1830s, Michael, Michael Faraday, Faraday. Well, Faraday was able to take some of the science that he was seeing and turn it into practical applications. And one of the practical applications was that he recognized the connection between the electric field and a magnetic field, and that things could be induced. Wires inducing um, current from a magnet or magnet, magnetism being induced in a wire with current in it, and, the, and they're interchangeable. And he did some experiments and showed that that could take place. One of the first applications for that was to use it as a semaphore in nature with a series of magnetic needles that would move when a current was passed through a wire close to that particular needle. So it would normally face in a certain direction, put the current through it, and it would change. So its switch would turn like a switch, and that indicated a message was coming through. Now, because they were used to flags, they at first started to look like big structures that sort of had needles all over them, making flag positions, not unlike semaphore. So that was the first ideas, and that was quite useful because it wasn't restricted then to weather. It also was manageable because you had a wire connected directly to your other guy, and the other, no one else could get into it unless they did something later, which became very popular, which was wire tapping, um, getting, hiding, uh, tapping into the wire and getting the messages from the wire. Um, there's another invention that comes out about this same time. That's Faraday's responsibility too. All right. What happens when you put a current through a coil of wire with a magnet next to it, or in it, the coil of wire? What will happen to the magnet? It will move. It moves. And that movement, backwards and forwards, can actually be used to control a switch or to make a noise, a tapping noise. All right. Closing a circuit would make the magnet move. Opening the circuit would make the move magnet return to where it came from. This solenoid switch, that idea of a coil of wire and a magnet in the middle of it moving backwards and forwards in a straight line, linear movement, could turn into something that would make a noise when someone else somewhere else did the same thing by closing and opening a circuit. Very, very simple, very basic. That is telegraph. And that became extremely important when, when Samuel Morse comes up with the Morse code. Because then people were starting to communicate messages really effectively across long distances. And, and within 20, 30 years, this is now the 1830s when these first ideas were being developed. By the 18, well, Samuel Morse comes up with a code in, in I think it's 1838. Um, by the 1850s, this was the main means of communication over long distances. We had a telegraph in um, Australia in the middle of this 1800s. The, the nation's only 50, 60 years old, and we're putting a wire across Australia so we can communicate across the distances. The Atlantic Cable went in in the middle of the 1800s. The idea of being able to communicate from continent to continent through the ocean. Actually, there's some good side stuff to that, because what happened when they put the cable down, the first thing that happened was that when they started to put the traffic through it, they didn't realise the resistance that they had to have at, to get the current to move the full distance. It was so, so it was so great, it was burning out the 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 cable. It only lasted about a week. Uh, and so, and it's, this is this expensive thing where you've got this ship that has to go out with this big roll of wire and lay it down across the Atlantic. Now, it's not a short distance across the Atlantic. Right? This is a lot of effort. And it's a deep ocean in some parts. So it was a difficult proposition. And the, and, and the consortiums that were built up to try and do this, because they could see they could make money out of it. You know, like if, if you could communicate that quickly across from nation to nation, and people wanted that information, you sell it. You know, they didn't do this for free. So the inventions, money made, this one. Um, so anyway, uh, by the middle of the 1880s, or by the 1860s, they were going, what's going on, this stuff? So they had to reinvent the cabling. And they started putting shielding around the cabling and doing other things to stop it burning out. But another interesting thing comes out of that later. By the, 18, by the 1950s, something had been noticed a lot 
about laying the cable down. The cable used to break. So they go back and to dig it up, you have to go down and you have to find out where did it break? How do you know where it broke? Now they had little repeaters every so often to help send the message across. So if they could work out that it was maybe in the next you know, 20, 30 nautical miles that the break has taken place. But then you've got to pull the cable up and look for the break. But what they were finding was it was breaking mostly in the middle of the Atlantic. Now this is later on, this is in the 30s and stuff, so this is much later. But why did it keep breaking in the middle of the Atlantic? No, it has nothing to do with that. It, is some, it leads to an entirely different invention, an entirely different piece of science just out of this. Seismic Not seismic activity, but very close. The ocean is spreading in the Atlantic. The mid-Atlantic ridge is coming up and the, the ocean is moving. Continental drift. So the, idea, the transatlantic cable started to get people thinking, the, the world's not stable. Stuff moves and they're moving apart. So the solution at one point was to lay the cable in a zigzag. So that as it expanded, the cable just got straighter. But eventually it's going to break anyway. But later on in the late, late 60s, the Americans would send out some survey ships to do some stuff in the mid-Atlantic. And they, they knew there was a ridge in the middle of the Atlantic and stuff because they take soundings and stuff like that. And then radar was helping and sonar was helping. Um, but they then were found out by looking at the soil samples they brought up. And this is getting off track, but it's, it's part, of, part of the process. Is they then found out by looking at it that the magnetic layer, when rocks are formed, um, heated and formed, they, they trap the, the natural magnetism at the time and the Earth's magnetic field changes slightly over time. It's not always in the same place. So the rocks showed an indication of what period they were looking at, or rather what, where, the, where the pole was when the rock was formed. And they could find these bands in the rocks on the seafloor of the Atlantic. And the bands were equal away from the center. So they could see the floor was spreading over time and predicted the time. And then, Clever scientists sit down and go, well, do you know something we've always noticed? A guy in the 1800s suggested this. If you cut out the, the continents, make a jigsaw puzzle out of them, they do seem to fit. Like, it seems logical, doesn't it? But there's no evidence of that. And, of course, a lot of people still believed in certain things about creation and, and how the universe was made and God made it exactly the way it is. So if you put the continents where they are, that's where they are and that's where they've always been. But it turns out, no. And so you start to bring them all back together again. And of course, now we understand Gondwana land, Pangaea. We understand from the flora and fauna in different places that South Africa, Australia, and South America were connected at one stage, that the, the, the Antarctic was in the equator at one stage. All that sort of stuff now is reasonably well understood. That the Earth is, is a moving and vibrant working material. Uh, and that, um, th that geology type of thing had a beginning in, in telecommunications because the cable kept breaking. Um, anyway, wouldn't it be good if you could get rid of the cable? Which is what happens in, in the late 1800s. But before we get there, there's something else took place on the way, which you uh, use with your phone, and that is the phone. Your mobile phone is a development coming out of the mid-1800s. Um, it's, it's largely attributed to Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, the Bell Company in America has the name for the phone company that, that developed and brought about the uh, beginnings of this type of technology. The story goes something along this line that Alexander Graham Bell was not a... Um, he, he was interested in science and he had a, a reasonable understanding of some of the things that were happening in terms of electricity and things. But his main job was to be a speech pathologist for people who are either profoundly deaf or mildly deaf. And one of the ways he would teach them would be to get them to speak into a diaphragm that the diaphragm would show a needle moving. So that you could, if you can't hear, how do you know what's coming out of your mouth? Because you can't hear it. But you know that something's coming out because you can, you can feel it. So he was giving them a, a visual clue as to what was going on by talking into these cones of, with a, a diaphragm attached. Now, whether he came up with the idea or it came from somewhere else, the, there, there were other experiments being done in a similar way, that the induction idea that movement of a magnetic field will generate a current in a wire allowed people to start thinking, well, if a diaphragm can move a needle why can't we get the diaphragm to move a magnet inside a coil of wire and generate 
a current. And the degree to which it moved would there be a, also a, a degree to which the current can be, so the voltage created would be an indication of how much movement was taking place. Now the cool thing about this is it's reversible. So that if you had at the other end of the wire a coil around a magnet attached to another diaphragm that when the wire had current in it, the magnet moved. One end you're moving the magnet up against the wire, the other end you're using the wire to move the magnet. Basic. It sounds really basic, but it has, someone had to come up with it. That is a microphone and that is a speaker. And essentially, they're both almost the same in, in basic design. Um, theoretically, you could turn one around and do, use it for the other. Um, so you, could get, you can get your little earphones and speak into them if you have them as a microphone and you're recording it the same way because it's just the same idea, just working backwards. All right? uh, you get really squeaky voices though because they're very small. Um, I've tried it, so I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it comes out really squeaky, it's quite cool. Um, so Alexander Graham Bell comes up with a view, a, a, a process that allows you to communicate in spoken word. Now spoken word wasn't very easily understood over the wire. So there, there was a need for you to be very careful with your diction. Diction being how you spoke. And in fact, it made you sound a little bit high pitched because the, the, the nature of the speakers wasn't very good. So a lot of people didn't like using the phone because it made them sound weird. So they would put on a very, very deep voice to speak on the phone. And they had different language for the phone. Um, at first, one of the th things to, to use was that they used a naval term. And, the, and um, Alexander Graham Bell invented this is, with his process. He said, look, what you should do when you pick up the phone is go, ahoy there, ahoy there. Um, then that got changed to a, a shortened other word that was being used, hello. Hello is a word invented for the phone. Another one is that people who put on a voice so that they could speak on the phone, or deep voice or whatever it was, weren't presenting themselves exactly the way they really were. So another term comes into the uh, language of the day, and that was phony. So a person who's a phony is a person who's putting on something because to not put on something would make you appear stupid or silly, or in, in the case of the speakers. But it was, was different, right? It, was, it took a while for the people to catch on to this too. There wasn't too many people. It relies on you having the person at the other end. So you have to set up a system. Um, at first, the only way they could do this was to piggyback on the already existing telegraph lines. Now, there's another problem with telegraph lines that had to be overcome. If you're sending a message down the line, in other words, there's a current going down the line, you don't have a message coming back. You have to wait until it gets there and return a message. Now, thankfully, uh, electromagnetism works at the speed of light, so you can go pretty quick. So it's not like you're going to notice. In a single conversation or a Morse code situation where it's a single line and you're sending a message down, then it really doesn't matter because by the time you've interpreted the message, then you can respond. Okay, so you need time anyway, so it's not a big deal. But once you start trying to get more than one message in any one time, and that term for that is multiplexing. Multiplexing becomes a big difficulty. And some of the solutions were mechanical solutions. And that was that you would have a dial that turned and allowed only a certain um, so you'd have a, a, an input coming from maybe five different places and an output going to five different places. So it's a bit hard to, you'd have to visualize it. So um, one line that's sending a message, right? And it can only do, go one way at a time. So you have five messages coming in or six and they've all got to go to their separate ones out here. So this is A and this is A and this is B and this is B. And you want the message from A to go to A. So you have a switch that rotates that only opens that one up when A is over here. And then as you move to B, the switch moves to B. And so this rotating time frame 
allows you to send messages down and back sharing the one line. It's called multiplexing. It's a mechanical multiplexing. We do it differently now, as so we'll see later in the course. We do it by sending different messages at different frequencies down the same line and then it's separating the frequencies later. But this was a mechanical method. Now, that developed into something that you know and you've probably seen in the movies. A telephone exchange where you have an operator who opens and closes different buttons and puts and this meant that this had to be identifiable at both ends so what are you going to do if you call them a b now I, that you can have 26 maybe then you go a a and then you got another 26 but when you start developing a big system with lots of customers and you want to identify the customers you start giving them a number so a phone number becomes important. The operators mm -hmm. open and close the lines at ends of the exchanges between the wires and the multiplexer allows you to have different conversations taking place over those time frames. Pretty cool. All has to be developed. Didn't exist, had to be developed. So engineers get involved in that. All right, so we arrive at the end of the 1800s and we have a telephone, we have telegraph. Um, we have also, they have ticker tape things too. Uh, what that is, is a, um, a way of communicating through a typewriter type situation. Because typewriters were being used at that time. And you can get the typewriter to type out letters or punch holes in a card which could be read if you knew how to read it. And you've probably seen film of the 20s and the 30s where people would read the ticker tape coming down the line. Um, little click, click, clicks. Um, little boxes with wire tape coming out and they'd read uh, so and so is up and this is down or something like this. All about commerce. And, and working out what's going on on the other side of the country in terms of stocks and such. All right, so we've got phones, we've got telegraph. The problem with all of these is the connection that you need. Like the Atlantic Cable, that would break, would need repairs. During the uh, development of the Americas, the Indians were, were very clever in working out that one of the ways in which the forts were being kept up to date with what was going on was down the telegraph wire. So guess what they would do? Cut the telegraph wire and pinch it. <laughs> Wrap it up, pinch it, knock the poles down. Um, and so a lot of the uh, military activity in the West in the first part of that process of the, the, the wars with the uh, Indians was really about keeping the telegraph lines open. So you go along the lines. The telegraph line would often follow the rail line or rather one would follow the other depending upon which would was made first. Um, telegraph lines were, uh, cutting telegraph lines was one of the big deals during the American Civil War. Um, getting uh, messages off the telephone lines was another one, and that's what I mentioned before. That's wire tapping. You climb up the pole, and you'd, if it's just a matter of t ticking as the pulse went through, as the current went through, if you put two <laughs> virtually bulldog clips on the wire, right? and then have a clicker in between, you can sit up the pole and listen to what's going on down the line. If, and so you can break into, as a spy, into the messages that were happening. Again, the American Civil War. And so then you have to come up with codes and stuff like that. So anyway, get to the end of the 1800s. And you've got a couple of guys who are working on a different thing altogether, They're trying to get their head around the physics of this electronic stuff and light and all these other things, and, and one of them is James Maxwell, and he comes up with a couple of formulas related to the predictability of waves, and he hadn't at this stage made the great connection that would be made by guys like Einstein and others later, that the wave was a dual thing, that light was both particle energy and photons, that is, and a wave motion at the same time and that all of electricity and light were one big spectrum with different wavelengths being involved. Now, that would come out of this period. But what Maxwell was able to do was to show that there were predictabilities in relation to the size of the waves generated by particular currents. Frequencies and amplitude were predictable. So if you could predict them, then you could read them. If you sent out the right pulse at the right voltage or amplitude, you could then get someone at the other end to interpret that as being a message from you in the first place. Now, the other person that worked on this were, uh, were at that particular time was, uh, I've just got to get his name right, Heinrich Hertz, 
and Guelamio, Guelamio Marconi, Guelamio. Heinrich Hertz is where we get the word Hertz from. Hertz is cycles per second, and he was related to the frequency stuff. And he worked out that it expanded and contracted with a node in the middle where there was no signal at all. And it was expanding out in three-dimensional waves. Um, physicists will know the picture of the two wave directions, you know, the one going up and one going out, and then coming back and meeting at a point and then going back out again. Um, sine wave, why is it called a sine wave? Mathematicians? Let me cancel this one out here. No, is it named after someone? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I suppose. Uh, what's a sign? In a sign, no, it's a sign, not a H. You know, in, in, in trigonometry. Right, so opposite over hypotenuse. So it's the ratio between, say if this angle is here, it's the ratio between that and that. Now, if that stays constant and that varies, what do you get? If that stays constant and that varies, let's do it. Let's keep that constant and vary it. What you finish up with is that the hypotenuse becomes the radius of a curve. And at every point on the curve, the hypotenuse, rather, the length, if you've got, this is going to change back into here, the sine is changing in relationship to that curve. And if you map that out, I've got a little, there's a nice little um, video I might bring in and show you, the little tiny thing from a maths site that shows how this develops. The wave that develops when you do that rotation from the circle is the different points along the height of the sine side of the opposite on the triangle as it goes around. So these are simply the, the heights or the position of sine as it changes in a rotation where the radius is the hypotenuse of a triangle. All right? So the form called a sine wave is, is based on the fact that that moves up and down. It's a nice little graphic. I'll bring it along next time you see it and I'll send uh, to the people online um, a link to it. Just have a look at it. It's just really nice to see how the sine wave develops. Um, anyway, that's why it's called a sine wave because it's mathematically the same as the uh, with the radius of the hypotenuse and the other so opposite changing is the, the sine side ratio. Those things, that mathematics, those are the guys that came up with these, these things, Maxwell and Hertz. Marconi, Guillermo Marconi, does something with this. He realizes that if it's predictable in terms of what it sends out, then it's predictable in terms of what you can read from it. So we're going to finish the story there because, isn't that timing? Perfect timing. So now we're at something that you will be familiar with for next time, and that is wireless or radio. All right? Still to come. Television, cell phones, all that, microwaves. Hmm. <laughs>